So good evening and thanks to everybody that showed up on a Thursday evening to talk about streaming. So we, I am assuming everybody here is really invested and interested. So we want your feedback. We want your questions. We want to know what you guys want to have answered. Uh, my name is Jim Nettles. Um, I am a science fiction, fantasy, horror, bit of this, that, and the other author. I'm also a nonfiction author. Uh, my normal life is doing business and technology consulting work. I work with uh, everything from startups and creative companies to Fortune 50s. And the reason I'm probably here is because I lost a bet and I run a virtual convention called Continual. Um, I've done a lot of podcasting, virtual network stuff over the years. Um, we have swag for Continual up here. When the plague began, um, something I had already been working on, Gail Z. Martin, John Hartness, and I went ahead and took that and co-opted it and created a virtual network for authors and creatives and for fans of horror and science fiction and fantasy and genre and romance and everything else as well as people that were interested in creativity and how it worked to be able to come network and do shows we've got some swag up here for it would we'll invite you guys to come up now before we get into all the fun and start talking about how all this industry works I'm going to ask my panelists to come up here and introduce themselves. So, Mal, you're up first. Oh, hey. So, I'm uh, Mallory Cooper. I write science fiction uh, books under M.D. Cooper, and I have um, about 120 books published. So, I've been at it for a little bit. Um, and also, my wife and I run a author marketing and... Um, I lost my train of thought. Author... Yeah, you can come by. <laughs> like, you can like author... Sorry, I didn't want to Author marketing and coaching um, you business gotta, as well. You gotta, you gotta give up your chair, TJ. And take yeah, it just like the other one. Here, give her this chair. And take that away. We'll just Pick a chair, any right, chair. Right, it's wrestling. We are not wrestling. <laughs> this is the joys of live shows. Is yeah. <laughs> so if you want to know the difference between yep. doing a live show and pre-recorded, this is it. Mm. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so I do. Um, I do lots of live streaming webinars. Um, I actually have an entire separate. Um, persona that I have online that I'm closing in on 100,000 followers on as well so I do a lot of live content for that and it's kind of just streaming on the internet like you said since the pandemic has sort of just become a de facto part of life TJ we'll let the authors or let the uh, <laughs> <coughs> attorneys You're speak him. I, I don't write anything I don't stream anything I don't have a podcast I'm boring shit um, I'm the lawyer I'm here to tell you if you're going to get in trouble for doing any of the things that you ask about doing. So uh, I'm, I'm an attorney here in, in Atlanta. I've worked on pretty much every aspect of internet business, technology, intellectual property. So uh, we cover all the soup to nuts, and I'm happy to tell you what works and what doesn't work from a legal perspective, what can get you in trouble, what can keep you out of trouble. But uh, as far as all the cool stuff these guys do, ain't me. <laughs> He doesn't get to speak again. It's <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I apologize for coming in late. Uh, there's a lot of people outside. Um, TJ, I think you're very important. Um, I'm here to learn more from you because I am an influencer and streamer and content creator, and we're kind of crossing lines these days where, you know, like, what's, what's in it, like, good protect ourselves, right? Um, but to introduce myself, hi, everyone. I'm Tiger Lily. Um, I work for Ants Online. I'm one of their streamers, and what that means is whenever they have hot new items, I stream and talk about it. So uh, if you have any questions about, like, what does that mean, I'm here to answer that for you. Aren't you still drink DreamHack rep as well? I am a DreamHack partner as well, which is an eSports event that happens here in Atlanta, and uh, we focus on tons of, tons of different things. I just help them create content. We focus on certain games, um, and we just do a lot of stuff. I used to be their indie stage host, but uh, I think now we've moved on, um, and we just talk more about like the games and the sports and the events that happen. Yeah, you're being way modest. Her <laughs> list of companies who come to her to promote their stuff. You just opened an Acer that made me drool. Oh, it was a Lenovo. Lenovo, oh yes. man, she gets the best toys. <laughs> okay, uh, hi, I'm Andrew Greenberg. I'm a game developer here in Georgia. I'm the executive director of the Georgia Game Developers Association. I also run the Georgia Influencers Network, where we support a lot of uh, uh, podcasters and streamers focused mainly on games, but not always, uh, on supporting each other, promoting each other's efforts. In addition, I'm the chair of the DeKalb County Entertainment Commission, 
And uh, in those two capacities, I've worked with the state to get live streaming covered by the Entertainment Investment Act, which is the film credit. That's right. Your live streams can get the same tax credit that brought all the movies here. You just have to be spending $500,000 first. <laughs> so just pay yourself a little more and make that happen. But in all seriousness, live streaming is one of the categories covered by the film credit. I'm very proud to have been able to work on that. And uh, I think we should be getting some streamers up in that ballpark not too long from now. Uh, obviously, at YouTube channel, Twitch channel, et cetera, and work with a lot of folks to promote and cross promote so Jim back to you well then so I actually want to start with how everybody got in the business and your take on it and I want to do this just kind of as a level set for everybody in the audience as to everybody can come in for a different reason from a different angle from a different passion and sometimes from a different path you know, well pathology but um, you know I actually came into media in when we were like transmitting radio using smoke signals and paper was done on stone. I started actually in traditional media. Um, I did AP wire. I did a lot of traditional media and radio. And even in college, it was the, you know, the college station radio, college station, you know, TV. I kind of moved into stuff. And then by nature of my career, I've been off and on. Um, the first time I did a podcast-like thing would have been in the late 90s before iTunes was a thing, before a lot of these things were a thing, but went out there and we recorded things that we were doing as workshops and programs and shows and stuff like this to be on. Um, so I want everybody to kind of talk about how they touch the industry, except for TJ, because we he doesn't count. He's an attorney. Um, <laughs> I had a media background. Like yeah, I know, I know, but <laughs> we're. But I, I think it's always interesting to know who is speaking up here to you and from what point of view, so that you guys know how to take this and interpret the answers we're going to give, because every one of us is going to have a different opinion based on what we're doing, what our goals, what our motivations are, and what our needs are, and so as you listen to our answers and what we say and what we do, think about what you're working towards and figure out how that may apply to you because all of our experiences are going to be very different and very differently scoped based on what we're doing. So Mal? All right, so back to me again. So You're I, up first. I first started doing live streaming back when I worked in tech. Um, I was a software engineer and we would have to do live streaming webinars talking about the products and whatnot. That's sort of how I got my feet wet and when I became an author Everybody's like, you have to have a podcast, you have to have a podcast. So I started up a podcast, and it was mainly just for my fans, and we did about maybe 200 episodes or so on that. So I kind of got my feet wet with having guests and managing a group of people on a podcast and, and getting that going. And from there, I've kind of moved back into, well, into two directions. One, the business that my wife and I have, we do lots of webinars where we train and coach authors and stuff like that. And then I've also started, I've always, I've been trying to start a gardening channel on YouTube for forever. And I'm like, how do I make this stand out? How do I make this stand out? And I couldn't do it. And then I sort of accidentally stumbled into the idea of a post-apocalyptic gardener. So I created this character of this post-apocalyptic gardener and I wear head to toe latex and a gas mask and everything like that. And I somehow found this weird convergence of like kink talk and prep talk that just <laughs> is all about that. And I got like um, 60,000 followers in like three months. Um, and I have a lot more if I didn't keep getting banned by TikTok. <laughs> it's happened, I've, been, I've been shadow banned twice now and full on banned twice, twice as well. So it's been a bit of a challenge. But, um, but I do live streams on that. And then of course then branched out into OnlyFans and I've created like a, an additional six figure income out of, out of that, out of gardening. Most successful gardener on OnlyFans? Possibly, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> it's, I'm in like the top. Three percent of OnlyFans creators now, so ah. yeah, and I live stream there too. <laughs> so TJ, we'll allow you to speak. This is your last <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> nope, still boring. So oh, I, wow. I, I came to this. I, I, I came to law school late. I uh, I got a master's in literature first. I was working in film and doing some stuff that was, you know, related to uh, to, to media, but for the most part. Um, nothing that paid the bills so I went to law school instead but that was always still my area of interest and so when I went to law school this is how I uh, have developed my career is in these 
in these areas in these capacities so I advise people again in, in these areas to how to keep themselves best protected how to keep your your assets your assets how to make sure you own whatever you can own um, and uh, and come at it from that side but really I come at it from the idea of the creator space so I want to protect people from that baseline of how do you keep what you're growing because there's no point in making a business unless you're going to own your business and, and own your content and own your assets and make money off of it so if you're not doing that then why are we doing anything so that's where I come at it from and and I just happen to come at it from a legal perspective and I've worked on I mean I'm on board with Andrew and done a variety of things in in the space but just not not the cool stuff you guys are here to listen about so <laughs> Uh, so I, I had moved from Oregon to Georgia six years ago and it was really hard. The biggest thing for me was staying connected with my friends. But moving here, I had to make an income somehow. So it was like, how do I continue doing that and also pursue something that when you're really young, you're like, oh, I really want to do that. And I really want to do that. You walk into DreamHack and you see all the flashing lights, you see the events, you're like, that guy's running that and that guy's running that. It took me about two years to figure out which lane I needed to walk down. So after two years of streaming online, doing a bunch of stuff, Tiger Lily started to develop and that's who I became. And my brand is what developed out of it. I, would, I loved interviewing Indeed devs because what we would do is we would just talk about their passions and the ground and where they were coming from and why they decided to make this game. And then two years later, I would see this game on Xbox Game Pass. And I'd be like, I was there. I was, it just so, felt so good to be a part of that. And like, you know, just highlighting things that really, you know, folks and devs are passionate about is what made me really happy. And I started to develop that into technology. So for about six years prior to my big move, I was actually in IT. And I was only in IT because I was trying to pay for college. I thought business and marketing is where I wanted to go, but I didn't know how to apply that. So, you know, I threw myself into a mixing pot, moved to Atlanta, put myself out there, I networked, I did a whole bunch of stuff, and then I became a streamer. And when we say that, you guys are like, what is a streamer? Like, what does that even mean? Um, but you, you fall into a lane, and you find people that believe in you, and you believe in them, and you work on these projects that just really come from it. And so here I am, and and when I say that I stream and I market and I either show off like a PlayStation 5, I show off the newest game, um, and that's really what my brand is. That's the lane I fall, have fallen into. And I, I really enjoy doing that. And, and I want to interrupt for just a second. Yes. So as an influencer and showing these things off, you only work like an hour a day, right? <laughs> I, I wish. <laughs> that's, a, that's actually a really great point. Um, a lot of people only see the hour, right? It's all about the strategizing beforehand. It's about the communicating. It's about, I need you to sit on this panel for an hour and talk, right? But before that, I had to really think about what I thought was important to the audience and what you guys wanted to hear. So. Of course, I would like to know what you'd like to hear, and we can elaborate on it, but it's when you're like, I'm a streamer, what does that actually mean? So, Yeah, I'm one of those people who calls up Ty Ruley and says, hey, I've got Indie Dev I want to have on a conversation with you, and then we sit and plan and discuss, and then we set up the stream and make sure she has a chance to test it out with the, the Indie Devs beforehand, and then we do the stream, and then it's edited afterwards, and uh, for one simple one-hour thing that she's not getting paid for, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of time, at least eight hours behind that. So I uh, definitely appreciate those sorts of efforts. And um, uh, it is interesting that for some of us on here, we are the content creators. And for others of us, we're using the content to promote the other things we do. And I'm very much at the mix of those. Obviously, as a game dev, I live stream my own games. I live stream other people's games. I want to be people to be buying Emperor of the Fading Suns when the new patch comes out or Noble Armada right now. Hint, hint, hint. Uh, that was our marketing shill. Every time somebody shills their projects, you'll hear that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, and but by the same token, uh, I'm working with a lot of other folks who need their titles promoted. And that's why Tiger Lily and folks like her are so awesome. Is that she's got a great brand of followers. We mix her with some of the indie devs with their smaller groups of followers, but they're dedicated followers, and we have a much better uh, event as a result of that sort of cross promotion and that uh, energy going together. That's why I think it's like the Georgia Influencers Network and the like. But I do love the fact that this 
panel is exactly that cross-section of folks who are either promoting their own things or are promoting other people's things via their channels or are really doing both. So, uh, you know, kind of looking at this, I want to actually start with the content because at the end of the day, doesn't matter what you're doing, if the content you're doing is not solid in quality, doesn't matter what you're doing. You can burn a ton of hours on something no one cares about. Or maybe 10 people care about, but if it's the right 10 people, that can be extraordinarily lucrative. And again, this is about content. Um, I own a company. We do, uh, we do a ton of different things. Um, you know, we teach workshops around how people do a ton of different things. I do a lot of consulting work. A lot of what come to us, comes to us and a lot of what we talk about is about intellectual property. The property being created. Who owns it? How do we deal with pulling in audio, stock video? How do we pull in and create tra headers and trailers? How do we do those things that really become important on packaging and pre and post production? So TJ, this is, I think, where I, I, there's a lot of value here in talking about the things that get people in trouble every day, YouTube strikes and all the kind of stuff that really creates havoc for those that want to make impact. Well, so let's start with the basic question of ownership. So ownership starts when you create something. In, in the sense of a copyright, um, we'll talk about trademarks in a minute, but in the sense of a copyright, the copyright is created the minute you you, you put something down in a tangible medium. You've created it and you've put it in a tangible medium. That means you've drawn it on paper, you've typed it on your computer, you've uh, taken the photograph, you've recorded the video. You now own the copyright in that content, that creation. The copyright exists as a right without a remedy unless you register it. Registration is not required to own the copyright. Registration is not required to send a nasty letter to anybody. But if somebody infringes on you, you can't do anything about it unless it is registered because registration is the keys to the courthouse door. So do I recommend you go record every live stream and, and, and try to register? No. But your basic content, some of your, your, your key content, you definitely should look into registering because that's how you protect that key foundational element. But then what happens when you put it on a platform? The, the one thing that a lot of people don't think about when they're choosing a platform or, or, or creating content for a platform is, what does that platform say about who owns your stuff? Because terms and conditions are binding legal contracts. And like many other binding legal contracts, nobody ever reads. Nobody ever reads them. I don't know what they are for most of the things that you're, that you're working on, but they have something in there. And they'll say something about whether they're going to own your content or they're going to have an exclusive license to your content or they're going to have a non-exclusive but perpetual license to your content. So know what you're putting out there. That's the thing that, that I think is the step most people miss is am I giving up something by going on this platform versus that platform? And that's how to protect your stuff. Now, how do you protect you? Don't use other people's stuff. Okay. The key, the key is that if it's not public domain, it's going to get you in trouble. You can license it. You can, you can get permissions. Those are all legitimate ways to go about it. But if you're going to put somebody else's video, somebody else's audio, somebody else's music into your stream, you're asking for trouble. You need to make sure that you can get that cleared properly and legitimately because even just a little bit of it is probably going to cause you a hassle, right? Everybody thinks about fair use. Let me tell you what fair use is. Fair use is a legal defense that you raise in litigation. That means you've already been sued. You've already come and hired me and paid me a really big retainer. And then I go into court and I say, but fair use. And 24 months from now, a judge will tell us if it was in fact fair use. And you will have spent a whole lot of money trying to prove that it was along the way. And if you aren't successful, you're going to spend a whole lot more. Because fair use isn't cut and dry. It's not a guaranteed thing. It's not an, I'm using this for education, it's okay. It's not an, I'm not making money off this, it's okay. There is no 
absolutely this is fair use cut and dry so don't rely on that argument to put content in your in your media you need to make sure that you understand what you're using and how you're using it and what you're putting it on and there's a ton of questions to go into that it's super fact specific but the real key is protect your stuff and don't use other people's stuff well, TJ, let's dig into that a little more because obviously that's what Tiger, Lily, and I do. Mm. We rip off other people's stuff all day long. <laughs> now, new Amazon loves it when Tiger, Lily plays their games on uh, on her streams, and they tweet her out to her and thank her vociferously. But obviously, that is really questionable. So, when I'm streaming other people's games, right? Well, what are we well looking at? so so there's again the, the question of of the question of infringement comes in in a variety of of factors. So, again, I'm going to leave the fair use argument at home. There, that's 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 two separate panels all by themselves. <laughs> yeah, well, and we're doing IP on <laughs> right. Monday and on a couple other. Topics. But there are the, the the question of infringement is: Are you when you're asking if you're infringing on someone? It's a question of: Are you using it in a way that is against the the exclusive rights of the owner? And generally, are you doing something that harms the owner? Because if you're doing something that helps me, I'm probably not going to care. Are you infringing? Maybe you're infringing. Maybe you're infringing all over the place. But if it gets me 20% more sales, that's the kind of infringement I like. So I'm okay so, with some of that. And I think it's worth to note, this is about promotion. <coughs> yep. How do I use media for promotion? So the reason I ask this question is because, again, be aware of what you're doing because there are ramifications. However, so Tiger Lily, as we look about what you're doing, exactly this. You are using other people's IP to build a brand, a reputation, as a part of promoting what they're doing. Right, so you, what Andrew was mentioning is New World, an Amazon Studios game that I like to play. Um, and there, agreement is that they want content creators to use their content. They provide us with what they refer to as a canto, um, an entire file with their logos, their sounds, their images, which is fine and you can use that. And we're actually communicating right now and providing more so that way the content creators aren't finding a dry, sp you know, like there's nothing left for them to use. So, like, what? How are we supposed to entice more viewers to play a game after like there's nothing left provided by the developers or publishers? You know, like it'd be cool if I could get some Snoop Dogg music in there. You know, people would actually want to watch and stuff, but um, that's just not the case. And how much would that Snoop Dogg music cost a license? <laughs> Way too much, I'm sure. But you know, it's it's just trying to keep things interesting in what I do without trying to take from what's already out there you know you're not allowed to copy you're not allowed to take and use things that aren't yours legally it's like how can I provide the content for them how can Tiger Lily bring entertainment to New World so that's what I try to do so Andrew with all the stuff that you guys do with gaming everything else you're kind of crossing both worlds of promotion, running events. You got a lot of stuff going on there. So, how does this kind of touch you guys in terms of whose IP you're touching? Because it's not yours. Right. And it's very interesting because companies have to be very careful about saying, oh, yeah, use our stuff freely out there. Make sure everyone's looking at us. And they will go to someone like Tiger Lily and make it very specific what is and isn't allowed. But 99.9% .9 of streamers don't have that and really are skating along. Now, within the association, I'm fortunate that our folks, including big companies like High res Studios and Tripwire, et cetera, are very willing to let us use their content um, uh, quite freely. So... 99% of the games we show are ones where the copyright owner has told us we can use it, but we have uh, developers who come in who want to talk about games that they worked on. Most of our content is about game development, and they don't have rights to show it, uh, but uh, it goes up, and uh, so far we're happy. So a classic example, there's an old uh, PlayStation game, Frequency, one of the very first music games and uh, the producer of it wanted to come out and talk about everything they went through to get this up and it's got this great following still to this day from a game from the early aughts and uh, it was one where we had to go back and forth what could we show what kind of music could we play from it 
uh, what could be allowed in the stream where before we felt we were really going to get into trouble. But at the same time, we're still promoting this game that theoretically could make some money for folks out there, or at least promote uh, uh, what they're doing. So, yeah, it is an interesting thin line uh, to skate across. And for most of our folks, they want it promoted and will give us explicit permission to do it. But if we want educational matters, we're skating on that fair use thing. I think it was fair use. I'm never going to go to court to prove it. Uh, but uh, we think that our our channel has value in providing that, promoting what this developer did before and teaching people through his experiences. The real, th the real thing to consider I is so there's there's infringement and all infringement is actionable but is it an action you want to take okay the the what i said earlier about fair use and how much you're going to pay me to answer the complaint and how much you're going to pay me to fight that lawsuit well the other side's paying just as much right they're 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 paying that too and they're trying to pay they're trying to prove that what you did was infringing and it is a gray line it's not it, it's not a if you if you republish someone's game, if you republish someone's book, if you remake someone's movie, you've clearly infringed it. It's it's not a it's not a question. Satire. <laughs> we are not going to talk about that. <laughs> Wait, this is not the IP panel. Never mind. So you're cut off. So Mal, much like much like myself, mm -hmm. you do a lot of social media to promote you, your work, all the stuff you're doing, right? Yep. And you make like twelve cents a day, right? <laughs> a bit more than that. So let's talk a little bit about from an IP standpoint. You're creating original content. Mm -hmm. How do you look at that? How do you feel about that? And what are you <coughs> willing to do to protect that? So I'm I'm very particular about my original content because I've created um, one of the biggest universes that no one knows about. It's called Aeon 14. I have 120 books in it. Um, sold millions of copies. And um, one day I would love to have a studio come along and want to make a movie about it. And I want to make sure that when that happens, I own everything. So that someone doesn't come along and say like, hey, you know, you can't use this character or you can't use this thing that you made um, in this movie and you're going to have to alter your canon or something like that. So I've been really particular, like even like the cover art that I get done for my books, I have done as work for hire, which means that the artist doesn't even own any copyright. The copyright's immediately owned by me. Um, I actually had um, a musician create multiple albums that I can then use for, have, so I have music for when I do podcasts and stuff. Um, and uh, I have, I'll, I'm even specific with artists who make art for me that they can't even put it in their portfolio without branding it with my brand. That way, you know, because once it gets out there, you know, without my brand on it, it's just everywhere and I'll never really be able to get it back again. So I do a lot of, a lot of that. I've trademarked um, my pen name. I've trademarked my universe. Uh, registered my copyrights, not all of them, but a lot of them, and um, oh, there's more. <laughs> I feel like there's so much more I do, and I guess I, I actually I act. I use software that actively hunts for pirated copies of everything that I make and issues takedown notices, just because I don't want to get it out there. They're like, hey, this person won't do anything if you take if you take their stuff, because I kind of opens the door for my understanding to make it so other people can just sort of say, well, they don't care. Um, so yeah, I'm always like looking for like people that are like have my audiobooks up on YouTube, um, which a great way to solve that was to put them up on YouTube myself, and then now YouTube is <laughs> them registered to me, and no one else can put them up anymore. So yeah, it's it's like an ongoing battle to constantly be protecting the IP that I've built, and make sure that other people can't take it. Because without the trademark, to be honest, like I write it under M D Cooper, without trademarking the name M D Cooper, anybody else could write a book as M D Cooper, and they could have called it an Aeon 14 book. You know, and there would have been nothing I could do to stop them from doing that. So I want to make sure that, I mean, there may still not be anything I can do to stop them because I might not have the money to do it, but, you know, I have something at least. So since we're here to talk promotion and getting the message out and growing brand and reputation and sharing across channels, so Tiger Lily, how have you been able to go about the work of growing and building your reputation? So, because I can tell you, there's channels we've done and built which was purely money spend, going through and dumping a bunch of dollars. Uh, Continual, which we've grown, has been 100% organic, you know, building through. But you kind of want to find that middle point. But how about you? What is it you've done? What has it taken for you to grow the work and the channel and the presence and the brand you've got? That's a really great question because for most influencers and streamers, you definitely want to invest in yourself. And there gets to a point where you, 
need help to start investing in yourself more, right? So um, I wish I was as talented and I could write books and, you know, like I, I would build That's a Mal, <laughs> not me. I'm just a smart ass. <laughs> I, definitely, I, I made eye contact. <laughs> but, I, you know, like I, I wish I was just as talented, but there is a point where I also needed help. So I do enjoy working for others, you know, DreamHack, Ants Online, Access Replay, um, Georgia Game Development Association, everybody. And, and what that does is it, it will help my brand, honestly, because I'm, I'm creating content for these companies and helping them promote themselves. Uh, there was a point where I enjoyed promoting myself, but I, I honestly get tired talking about myself so much. I'd rather talk about the amazing projects that Andrew's working on or come work on a panel with you guys and talk about Mel. Like, Mel, if you wanted me to, I could talk all day about your book. Just tell me and I'll do it, you know? Great. So you're saying it's not about you, it's about the people you meet, you know, and you network with? I definitely. This is why I love going to <coughs> events like Dragon Con, because I network with individuals who have projects that I end up believing in because I think what you're doing is phenomenal. By the way, I don't see notepads running out there <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> I'm not subtle. Uh, you know. <laughs> well done. So Andrew, how about you? I mean, from the perspective of what you're doing, because you're growing not only the stuff you guys are doing, you're also involved in growing those brands. You're, you're involved in growing those labels. You're involved in a lot of different parts of that. So from a marketing perspective, you're both marketing and promoting other people's work as well as marketing and promoting your brand and your events. Now, I'm fortunate in that this is for a trade association, so it is part of my job to try and make sure that everybody in the trade association is getting publicity. So it does help that uh, part of my job says get all the members more attention, more eyes on them. So we have <coughs> Georgia Game Devs, G spelled out Georgia Game D-E-V-S, on YouTube and Twitch, and uh, on those we have... I think it's about 600 uh, videos on all aspects of game dev, which is actually a problem because if we were just talking about Unity or Unreal or game art or some aspect of coding, we'd do a lot more successfully instead of having videos about every aspect of game development. But be that as it may, those allow us to promote the developers because all of them come on talking about their specific forte, their expertise. And they are plugging the Game Developers Association. Thank you, Tiger Lily, whenever they're speaking. So we, uh, we get that cross promotion back and forth. But it is part of my job to make sure that there are more eyes on them. When I do videos. I do have my own HDI Andrew YouTube channel, but I put very little up there. Most of my own stuff I put up on Georgia Game Devs because it gets more eyes that way. And I'm talking about my own game development along, along the way. But uh, I just stream Saturday. Um, just basic game dev on a patch I'm working on for my Emperor of the Fading Suns games and there are hundreds of people watching me talk about the game and play it at that moment. So this will get sales for the game, this gets eyes on the Georgia Game Developers Association and make sure those folks come back to watch other sh game showcases uh, we do along the way. And it really is about <coughs> building up a community to do this. I think that the best aspect of promoting and marketing. Well, one of the arguments I make about games now is that the best game is no longer the prettiest or the one that hides the fact that it's really just a database the best. It's the game that delivers the best community that is the most successful. And now it's all the, the best most games. addictive. Yeah. And the, the community comes along and praises it and so forth. And therefore, I'm taking all these different game communities and game development communities and trying to mix them together as best as possible, get eyes on things that matter. And that's why I love working with other creators to promote each other, is they bring a community of value to talk about. And as long as we continue to focus on the community, when we promote, we're trying to promote to our communities things that we think they will find of value and not just try and rip them off, not just try and suck money out of that. It has to constantly be about not the dollar then, but this community that will come along and continue to be an active and integral part of the promotion process. Somehow, because you're building brand and it's all about you. Mm -hmm. You're building multiple brands. What is it you do to go to reach people, to reach and grow and, and try to connect with poten potential fans and also potentially those people that aren't going to be interested? Because again, we only care about those people that are potentially long-term fans, right? Yeah. I mean, so my, I have this sort of this strange thing. I'm like this bizarre fashionista. Um, I write hard military science fiction books that mainly appeal to um, 
white Republican men who live in the Southeast United States, I'm queer as fuck. Um, <laughs> so it's I, I, I had to like figure out like how do I mesh all of these things and also like I coach authors and I teach authors on, on marketing and stuff like that and like how do I br blend all this into one brand and it took years actually of really thinking about it and like trying to figure out how to build all these different elements of my brand into one thing and and I had to carve off parts uh, of my my readership and other followers who wouldn't really fit with who I was gonna be so a lot of who I am um, and who I present is actually as much a way to filter out people as it is to bring in the right people because I don't want to spend a lot of time and energy um, you know marketing to people and engaging with people who ultimately aren't going to be long-term fans and whatnot so by actually to be honest by being the most authentic version of myself possible I've, I've managed to do that to pull in people who are who are who like me and who like what I have to offer whatever I've, whatever I'm creating whether I'm gardening whether I'm writing whether I'm teaching someone how to do Facebook ads, you know, they get the same version of me and it's all the same brand all the time. And then it bleeds into everything else that I do, which is which is great because I'll take people that I teach how to market books and they turn into like readers and buy like a hundred of my novels and stuff like that, you know, so it's, uh, and even things like um, uh, start a, to, to talk about building brand, I'm running a Kickstarter for a 10 year anniversary of one of my books and some of the Kickstarter levels are classes that I teach. So I can like hit higher levels and higher, higher amounts of money in Kickstarter, you know, by, by bundling and other things like that. So it's, it is all about like, I've lost the question now at this point, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you gave a great answer. I was learning, you're Look, doing great. I play volleyball, I throw <laughs> something in the air and go, okay, what, what do you say? <laughs> cool. Um, it, well, but I think the important thing here is this, because again, everybody in here wants to know how to reach people, right? Mm -hmm. That's why everybody's in here is we all like to reach people except for TJ because he reaches out and sends I'll like reach people's wallet. yeah um, uh, you know this is one of those things that we teach is all the fundamentals of how to operate the business how to how to do all the fun stuff and marketing and reaching people and I think one of the important parts of this is the idea of if you're approaching this you have to understand all the fundamentals. it's not just about how do I grow the numbers? It's not just about the numbers. So TJ, from your perspective, you know, as an attorney, looking at how people approach things, are there any risks to as people start to recognize us out there as public figures? Well, so there's a couple of different ones. Uh, one is that your your if you get far enough into being a public figure then your protection for defamation goes down. So don't go too far into that. <laughs> um, but but that's, a, that's, a, that's a risk. Uh, the other risk is that you're putting more, well, you're, you're hanging out more hooks for people to, to, to grab onto. So when you're, when you're creating content, your content can be stolen, your content can be infringed. But when you're creating content and a brand, now your brand your name, your 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 marketing can be infringed. When you get big enough that your personality is your brand, well then your personality can be infringed. And you've got rights of publicity questions and, and rights of privacy questions and whether those are you know are, are out there. So there's there's a variety of things that, that come along with the bigger you get the more you have to watch and the more you have um, that you want to protect. So as we dive into kind of the next thing, I'm going to invite anybody who has questions because, again, we want to make sure we're answering what you guys are here looking for. There is a mic at the front of the room. Start forming a line. <laughs> so, but not until I say so. Um, <laughs> no, you can form the line. You just don't get to do anything until I say yes. Um, you know, again, my big question is this. So, Andrew. From your perspective, what do you guys do to promote what you guys do, and how does that fit into your virtual world? Sure. So, uh, people still, uh, older people still <coughs> cannot understand why folks enjoy watching other people playing video games. Frankly, we all enjoyed it as kids. If you just had like an Atari, everyone sat around the couch and watched one person and heckled them the whole time. We get the interactive heckling on the uh, YouTube channels as it is. But, um, it is uh, very much about getting it presented as best you can by someone who's going to 
make people want to watch them. Again, this is something Tiger Lily does very well, and part of why she's so attractive to folks coming to her, paying her to promote things. Uh, good stream, someone with whom you want to interact with. I am a firm believer in the interactive interactivity of streaming, that that's core to it, that those audience comments are absolutely uh, required. And she does a great job of encouraging people to talk and having them uh, not make complete idiots of themselves at the same time. Um, so that level of involvement, that gives the, the fans more of a feeling of ownership along the way. I am a part of this experience. I'm integral to what they are doing. Even if the fan didn't create anything, they created some witty comment in the chat or shared some factoid nobody else knew, and suddenly they feel more invested as a result of that uh, momentary uh, 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 dopamine hit or whatever they felt good about at that time. So being able to encourage people to invest more of themselves in what you're doing to care more about what you're created what you are doing at that moment that is absolutely uh, critical for us for games i mean we we love the fact that games are a way for people to exercise their minds be doing things be involved in a world but really it becomes a part of what uh, they care about about themselves and their identity in case you notice there are one or two people here dressed up like game characters at dragon con <coughs> who would have uh, imagined that so uh, the ability to get that audience to care even more about what you're doing care about something they enjoy anyway see it from new uh, in new light see someone else do it give them spark their ideas about what they can do that's all magical and valuable and frankly, as a game developer who likes to uh, stream my game development, I love the feedback I get from people while I'm devving and even while I'm doing QA, doing playtesting online. They're, they catch things I didn't, and that's, that's amazing. So uh, it, it works all across the place. And thankfully, TJ, yes, it does end up in sales as well. So we get to the core, too. So now, because you're trying to create multiple brands, right? Mm -hmm. What is it? How do you market those? How do you identify your different branding, your different ideals? And I mean, like you said, you, they're all you. Yep. I mean, there's a lot of different me's, but they're all fundamentally the same smart ass jackass. <laughs> so, you know, for you, they're all still fundamentally you, but different aspects. So, how does this work for you from a marketing aspect, and what do you use it for? So, I mean, a lot of the marketing that I do is just straight up paid social media marketing. Um, for get, from selling books, I do most of my marketing on Facebook. Um, I probably run between three and seven thousand dollars a month in Facebook ads to sell books. Um, other things I try to do are grassroots. I, I believe really firmly in, in always be doing all types of marketing all at the same time. So I do a lot of grassroots marketing. I do a lot of networking too, where I'm like trying to find people who can then promote me to their fans because they they like my brand and maybe my brand aligns with them in some way. So there's always there's always like a. a overlap like that <laughs> um, and then some of it is like working really hard to I mean it sounds kind of silly to say it but like to try and find something to be viral with um, and try and figure out a way to go viral with something I I tried four different gardening um, channels and ways to do like a gar try and make a gardening channel before I found the one that worked um, I've, I've been trying to figure out a way to create a comic book character um, that I could then sort of run Kickstarters around and make comics for for years, and I finally have hit upon that as well. So, like a lot of the things I'm doing, where I'm building this brand and trying to bring people into into all things I do, it's been taking years, you know, to find the right confluence, to find the right thing. Like this works well to market on Facebook. This has actually took off on TikTok, and I literally get paid by TikTok to make videos. Like I don't, I don't have to. And I, I just even send people to OnlyFans. TikTok literally pays me to make videos at this point, you know. So, and that was just sort of like working over and over again and honing this this, this persona until I got the right one that works. So it's it's a lot of different angles that I'm always playing, and it's and a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's the, it's years of work. And, and the one thing I want to reinforce everybody is immediate success is unlikely. <laughs> I always say overnight success it was ten years in the making. Right. If you're lucky. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because again, one of the things I've done a lot of, because I've done a lot of media of different types over the years, is all about what are you taking things, and because media changes on such a regular basis. I mean, a couple of years ago, toxic talk was not a thing. <laughs> um, that might have slightly shown my opinion of the platform, but it's extraordinarily valuable if you use it in a particular way. 
knowing why you're looking to target and use a platform is as important as the content you're creating because the content you create and I think you'd agree mm -hmm. the content I create for Facebook often is going to be very different from that for TikTok because yeah. I got nearly unlimited time we run hour-long panels on Facebook TikTok or IG stories is much shorter it's snippets it's it's the highlights and there's even the type of content I can put different stuff on Twitter and Instagram that I can't put on TikTok and I can't put on YouTube you know so I make different versions of things for the different platforms mm -hmm. so TJ yes sir any thoughts on that damn attorneys <laughs> they take all the fun out of life the only thing I will say though is talking about just just on the subject of sponsorship and sponsoring ads and the the FTC has been very clear that if you're advertising well you're advertising and that falls under the FTC um, so you do need to make sure that you're being very clear that if you do have a sponsored product or if you've got uh, if you've gotten some benefit for promoting the product that you're clear that you're making an advertisement and that you're following the FTC guidelines to do it so that's the only thing I think as far as sponsored content what if I but, but really my quick to good product huh? what if I'm my still own have product? to disclose it, <laughs> it, 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 it you promoting you is yeah but, you but is one thing but you 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 sponsoring a product yes is gen yes. in other words yeah. so if I'm promoting me I don't know why the hell I do that but if I'm promoting the workshops that we do I have to disclose the fact that even though it is me promoting them and it's my company I'm promoting my company's you, you, workshops right. that this is I'm affiliated with this workshop and this is I mean when you got something like Mal this product is Mal mm -hmm. then you're promoting yourself. It's easier yeah. that way. But yeah, you do but have to you have to disclose your affiliations. You have to disclose any benefit you receive or will receive. Um, you have to disclose any benefit your your mom received. <laughs> you know, even if it didn't go directly to you. Um, so there's there's disclosure requirements. There's advertising disclosure requirements that come along with it. So just make sure that you're complying with that because that's another one of those areas that can get you in a lot of trouble. And to and Jim's it, point, it's on all the media you do it on. So if you do yeah. something on Facebook and you say at the start of that this is paid and then you cut it up on Instagram, you don't have that on Instagram, you're starting mm -hmm. to violate those uh, mm -hmm. those regs. Because, and again, it could also depend on your company structure. Because if you are if you're set up as an LLC, but it's you still, you're looking at a little bit different operation from I'm an S corp or a C corp that I'm a corporation, but I'm promoting my corporation. That's two different entities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. So Tiger Lily, how about you? What are you doing to promote all the stuff you're doing? I actually have a question for you, TJ. Can I ask a question? <laughs> no, no, not at all. He's, we got, no. <laughs> Can, of can, course. Can I ask a question? Tell me if I did this properly, right? No. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, a great example of promotion is I've been contacted by tech companies, right? So Lenovo is currently the most recent one. Mm -hmm. um, we communicate via via emails. There's no contract, so I didn't sign anything. They didn't sign anything, but we do have a partnership, and the agreement is um, they would send me a product, I would unbox and open it online, and then I would post it. Should I have put hashtag ad? Do you need to keep product? Yes. Yep. Okay. Edit time. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So when Twitter allows me to edit my posts that I posted like last week. <laughs> right. It's, 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 that's like, it's, it's not necessarily being paid for. It's not necessarily being an employee of it. But you're being compensated. You got something for it. You got some benefit. You got free product. Even just mutual uh, cross promotion. promotion. Mm -hmm. Right. If Lenovo, if, if Lenovo puts out some Tiger Lily content. Oh, you gotta, awesome. you gotta, open it. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta go ahead and and, uh, and 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 list it all. So anything you get that's a benefit, it makes it a sponsorship. That's makes it a sponsored ad. But that, I mean, that kind of goes into your question, right? So, so yeah, what are you doing to sponsor your channel, which ultimately brings in sponsors for your channel, which ultimately generates you revenues? It does. What um, what it does is working with reputable brands like Lenovo. Is it? It's letting the community know that you know. Wait, I'm a reputable Lenovo. Oh, sorry, that's a <laughs> <laughs> what brands? You know, like Microsoft, whatever. If you think they're cool, whatever. But like, what it does for the community in my case, what it's doing is helping my brand. Is it's helping the community know that there's someone backing me up, and that really does help me with. You know, like I never cared about viewers. I I always stream to the same 15 people. I love you. 
you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, it, but it builds up after that because I'm providing content for like this gaming chair company. I'm providing content for computers and um, on this. This is all specifically for like Tiger Lily. No, not, no one I work for, nothing like that. It's for me. But you know, I would love to protect myself, and that's why I was really interested in being on the panel with TJ today and learning more because I don't want to get in trouble. Really, he's the one that brought you here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> I mean, so I say yes to yes. Yes. Like, I, when you're looking at the panel, you're thinking, huh, there's a lawyer and then there's a kink gardener. <laughs> Yo, I'm, I'm just going to leave. I'm done. I'm out. I'll say yes to Andrew, but the kink gardener, uh, yes. <laughs> and welcome to Thursday at Dragon Con. <laughs> and you still do get around to, what are you really doing to promote? <laughs> what am I doing to promote? I, for me personally, for the Tiger Lily brand, it's a lifestyle. It's an everyday thing. So it's I'm not trying to sit here f f 24 hours trying to figure out how I'm going to grow this month. I just it's what I do every day, and I enjoy it. It keeps me sane. It keeps like like everyone that's around me sane. Like I'm not taking from my family. I'm not taking from myself. I'm able to balance everything really well. And so my promotion is a lifestyle. Like it's what I do every day. I'm posting on my Instagram stories. I'm posting on my Facebook. Posting on my Twitch. And I I am one of those sad individuals that lost a platform. Mm -hmm. I used to be a partner on Mixer. Microsoft decided to cut it and remove us, and they gave us Facebook partnership as like I don't. No collateral um <laughs> so from that i learned to more invest in myself like my kingdom is me and i don't care about like i care about the platforms of course but i think my brand is more important and that's the one thing i learned about losing my platform so i'm just promoting myself every day in a lifestyle so i'm gonna put one more thing out there then i'll let you ask your question because <laughs> i don't see a longer line uh, subtle hints subtle i'm not subtle but let's see people Come on. Um, so this is for Tiger Lily and for Mal, for you guys. Because um, I think this is a really big question about potentially losing your platforms. Because you may build a huge following, but you're playing on somebody else's playground, which this is your living. When you're making money on somebody else's playground, does this bring risks for you guys or concern about what do you do to mitigate that risk? I'd love to hear what you have to say, Mel. Um, <laughs> so I've, yeah, I've been publishing on Amazon now for um, a little over 10 years. And I've seen a lot of things happen on Amazon where, um, like back when, when Kindle first came out, um, the, the top 100 um, titles on Kindle were like just like weird ass porn, you know, like stuff that like people barely acknowledge exists. And, and Amazon like cleaned house and like changed their rules and got rid of all sorts of people who were writing, who were writing content. And they've done that three times now where they've completely changed the rules about what you can publish and how what they allow and how they're gonna bring the hammer down on different people for different things. And it's caused people to completely lose their careers multiple times. And even there's people, I, I know this one guy, he was uh, the number one selling science fiction author on Amazon. He was probably making about $3 million a month and Amazon yanked his account Told him he can never publish with them again and he still doesn't know why and because they're not required to tell you why um, they do this it's in the contract basically basically the Amazon contract literally says if you kind of like drill down it says we can do whatever we want and you can't do anything about it uh, is, is pretty much where it gets to and um, they're no nicer than a proctologist without a glove mm -hmm. or never mind yeah I think there's minors in the room <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah so I I I'm very always very cognizant of the fact that like I, my major platform is Amazon. Um, I guess a bit now only fans and TikTok are other major platforms of mine. Actually, I make pretty good money on YouTube too with some stuff. So I'm always like worried about like okay, what am I doing that could get me nuked on one of these platforms, or is the platform going to go away? And I just I diversify like crazy. I'm like as, I'm on as many platforms as I could possibly be because I know that that they could go away, and I'm worried, always working on building a, a brand and a following on each platform to give myself longevity. I love that. Um, how I learned how to diversify myself was actually working with the indie dev community. Uh, I was working for Fanaticus XR, and we were learning how to market their game. And by learning how to market their game on different platforms like Reddit, Instagram, Twitter, I was like, well, I'll just apply that to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And the one thing I learned is you are your kingdom. 
and just remember that if you're going to build yourself on Twitch, Facebook, YouTube, that at any time that platform can just throw a ball at, like, you know, it just ruin your day. So just remember that you're important and to read your contracts and to make sure to protect <laughs> yourself and make friends with TJ. <laughs> well, so here's going to be the thing I'm going to add to all of this. And Scott's over in the corner going, oh, God, I've heard this before. Um, have a way to pull people off of their platforms onto yours. Mm -hmm. Bring people to your real estate. The best thing that you can do is have an email mailing list. If your platform goes away tomorrow, if you are deplatformed, if you are deplatformed and you have an email list you can send something to and says, I'm over here now, what have you lost? You're still going to lose something. You're going to take a hit. But also, if people have signed up and said, I'm willing to let you into my life via email, it's a very personal effect. So make sure you have the ability to connect with people on your real estate, regardless of anything else. If nothing else, use other people's platforms to get them to your real estate so that you are the brand. So, questions! <laughs> now that I've been like cheerful and like raising doom and gloom and the world's gonna end. Um, so, oh wait, you're here. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's do this, okay. Okay, TJ, they've been making fun of you, but. No, I have, let's do I. Okay. Your beard is beautiful. <laughs> I love I love your fade and it's that 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 takes some effort and that's Have just a good barber. That's, oh that that is it's just beautiful. Better than mine. I mean, oh wait. So, I, <laughs> uh, my question's kind of like I, I haven't started streaming or anything yet. I I actually have like people begging me to start streaming because I've appeared on other people's streams and they're like, you need to start your own channel. So. Um, so I've been getting some stuff ready. I got like my mic and everything. But one of the things I thought about doing was like hiring people to make like an intro song for me and stuff like that. So the legality of some of that can get a little fishy because if somebody makes something for you, like you have the free use to play it in certain places. But some of that stuff gets a little touchy. So if you, I've heard, let's see, that's the thing. I don't know this stuff because I'm not a lawyer. Remember what Mal said earlier yes. about making sure you have everything as a work for hire. Yeah. Okay, you want to get a work for hire. You want to get an assignment of everything that can't be a work for hire. If you Not everything can be a work for mm -hmm. hire. But yeah, you want to make sure that if someone creates something for you, you own it. Because if they create it, they own it. That's the key, right? Mm -hmm. Remember what I said, you own your copyright the minute you create it? When they record that song, they own the copyright to that song. So how does that copyright get to you? Mm -hmm. Or how is it always yours to begin with? And that's the, what Matt was talking about with making sure that you have when you're creating content for you to use, that you make sure that you get that content, you own that content, and then you're free to do whatever the hell you want with it. Yeah. But you've got to make sure that you have that ownership. That's the key first step. Otherwise, and, there's always somebody who can do something to you. And, and I'm going to give an example for that. So, Valentine Wolf, that's here this weekend, um, both has done things for us for like with some of our authors. They'll do a musical backup for them. That we can copyright. They also have original albums and things, and they've come in and shared videos and original copies and original versions of those with us. However, we've still gotten some strikes because they're like, somebody says, well, we have the copyright for that, and we go through the argument about who has permission. So even though you may have ownership of the copyright, giving someone permission on some of these platforms is still problematic. Yeah, and this is something that's changed. Uh, I used to work with, well, I still work with musicians, and I used to just buy rights for interactive. I would not I would let them do the soundtrack to their music. They'd sell the rights to that, but I would have all rights to having computer games. <coughs> Unfortunately, as soon as it's going up on YouTube, if yep. they've registered their stuff with YouTube, suddenly I'm getting strikes or something I really do have legitimate rights to. So uh, it has gotten more and more to the point of you've got to grab all the rights, make sure no one else can go after it. And even then, there can be problems. We did an event at Turner where we showed some projects. Uh, we put some of the stuff up online. They put some of it online. And then they, Turner, started claiming ownership of all the stuff from other people's works that they put online. And we started getting copyright strikes from Turner on other people's work. So, And, and not the fact that we're running out of time or anything, but 
we've got one more question to go. So I want to make sure that, because, you know, like I solicited people to come up here and chat, and y'all only like two of you showed up. No <laughs> guilt at all. I actually have two questions. You get one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I asked my first one, and I went to that. Um, how would you like me to address you? Mallory? Mallory. Um, you said that you that you trademarked like your your pen name and a bunch of other stuff just how far do you have to go with that because i have a i have a couple of different twitter handles and other uh social media things and whatnot do i need to like copyright those kinds of things too or that's you trademarking can, yeah you trademarking can't. You know, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but you can't copyright. There's a lot of things you can't copyright. You can't copyright a series name or something like that. You can't copyright. Like, I can't copyright a book title and stuff like that. But I can copyright my pen name because that's sort of like a persona that I created. So I was able to copyright that so that no one can publish. But it's a narrow copyright, too. Like, I have it copyrighted for science fiction um, books and other types of media. If another M.D. Cooper started writing romance, I don't hold a cop or Sorry, trademark. Sorry, use I have a trademark on MD Cooper, and if someone was writing romance under MD Cooper, I couldn't do anything about it because I didn't trademark in that in that realm. Um, and I also did my universe name, Aeon 14, that I trademarked as well. Um, but I actually, there's like it gets really tricky. Like I can't, you can't exactly copyright character names. So someone could actually still write a book a lot like mine with the same characters, and there's kind of no way to get around some of that stuff. Yeah. So you just have to sort of just make like reasonable protections that aren't too onerous to put together you know Wait, and, and we're doing an IP panel on Monday um, afternoon I would suggest coming to as well yeah I may not be able to stick around that long but a little hey, hey Scott do we get a couple of minutes of overtime yeah, yeah we're left in the night, so. okay well we got a couple of more minutes then so we're gonna rotate because he's got another question Actually, and then I'll make you wait and a third question oh Lord sorry <laughs> So you mentioned earlier infringing on a personality type. Now my draw is the fact that I'm just an awkward dude. So what are the examples of people infringing on your personality? Your your personality your your personality is your defined public persona. So it's not it's not I'm the awkward one or I'm the jock or I'm the nerd or I'm the it's those are those are yeah, they're, 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 they're tropes, they're not types. Your infringement on your rights of personality is when you're using something that makes people think that you specifically are involved with or endorsing something. Like the mask that I wear when I stream. Well, yeah, so that if that's, if that's part of your, your identity, then someone wearing a very similar mask could be infringing on either your trademark or your rights of publicity. They're, they're not completely un overlapping but they're they're uh, it, it just comes down to where you're doing that so it's it's something that identifies you that's the that's the key and, and if I can cut in we actually did this for a client that cosplays a play cosplays their character they created for their book series however we also went through the trademarking of the character the rep representation the outfit the cosplay that they use on their their channels for their their multiple streaming so coming in and going you know I'm a you know X Y and Z is pretty generic but if you're down to the character you created then you have I think much more opportunity to protect it but again you can also protect it only as far as you're willing to sue the shit out of somebody wait did I say that yeah, <laughs> um, yeah well <laughs> <laughs> Look, I just had a conversation with somebody this week going and saying, do you have 50 grand? Then no, you're not going to even start talking about the fact that they got to the trademark faster than you did. Sorry. Go ahead. Hi. Um, my question is for the content creators. Um, basically, uh, you guys both have mentioned multiple platforms that you're working on. Um, are you working, like you're creating all the content for all your um, social media is by yourself or or have you invested in um, kind of like assistance and such and at what point did you make that shift if you are uh, I'm I would say that I've got a small team like s I, as in like myself my husband and like my moderators who help me out online they you know they they like to help um, what they what they do with for me is like they see things that I need to focus on 
Buddha, for example, in the back will clip me doing the stupidest things, and then we've that's what ends up on my social medias, you know. But like, there's no contracts, like, they're just doing it for fun, and that's all, how it is. I don't have like a team where like I'm paying people, I don't, you know, I'm it's just me, I'm a single entity. Um, but I do work for a company that's much bigger for than me, and I provide their like content for them and then the team their social media team and their marketing team takes what I do and then they filter that out into the world they have to go through whatever screening they need to do legally and making sure things are safe and stuff um, but I, I I would say that I'm too small to have like a big team or anything but for anybody mods are magic yeah. Yeah. get folks uh, to help out I I am at the point where I need to get a team now so I'm actually like looking for people to help me manage my social media because I've got I don't know on all the different platforms I probably have like 25 different like accounts across multiple social media platforms and I've realized that I am just like not good at keeping things up to date anymore plus like just monitoring the comments to make sure there's nothing terrible in there so yeah it's it's the thing I'm looking for first is I'm actually looking for like someone to help moderate like some of like saying but my stuff is less live and more pre-recorded although I do have live stuff as well but moderating and then actually someone just to like to make sure that the right stuff is going up in the right places and the right schedules is like a turning into a full-time job at this point. Oh yeah, you so. need like a full I, squad to help with that, yeah. you know. So for continual, we have six of us that are the core team. We've got three other people that kind of operate in the background on certain specialties and we pull in other people based on needs. So I mean our total team is about 12. Um, for continual now for the workshops company and for what I do um, I am the primary content creator um, and I've got three people that do different things very specifically for me um, and then when we produce content for other people so in other words if we're recording other people's workshops things like that um, my team manages and produces all that we've got camera stuff uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went to go hang out at Authors and Dragons Con because mm -hmm. friends of mine were putting it on and I could go hang out and drink. But I was also doing all the video production and stuff for them. But I was the producer. I was doing the video because I was there taking up space and, well, I was there to hang out. Um, I will honestly say that this is all about the network you create, the people you create. But as you start to generate revenue, look at it and shift from it's working and it's fun to this is a business and these are people that need to be paid. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Anybody All right. Else? Going once. Going twice. Well, guys, I want to thank you guys very much. Oh, come on up. You didn't say gone, I guess. <laughs> nope, I'm slow, I'm old, and I'm tired. <laughs> really going into streaming like that but I am I was interested in hearing all of this from everybody but I do have a question for Andrew because um I actually like want to go into the game gaming development and so right now I'm in college I'm actually a freshman in college and I wanted to know what can I do from here on out like from do you have any advice that I can go from here Yep. Go, go to KSU on September 13th we're having a meeting there uh, with the Georgia Game Developers Association uh, from 6 to 9 p.m. Um, the basic information is up on our ggda.org website. Uh, more information will be coming out soon. We also have a Facebook group. Um, most places are Georgia game devs, but I think we are actually uh, Georgia game developers on our Facebook uh, side of things. We have the Siege Convention October 7th and 9th. A lot will be virtual presentations, but we'll have a lot of indies getting together. That's www.siegecon.net, S-I-E-G-E. C O N dot N E T, uh, and it'll be October 9th in uh, Doraville, will be the main in person part of it. Uh, and on Sunday at uh, 5 30 p.m., I'm speaking on video game development with Mike Katz, who's one of the founders of uh, Epic Games. So uh, we'll be talking about uh, a lot of info on, on basic game dev. What college are you going to? I'm in Chattahoochee right now. I'm actually typing Chattahoochee Tech. Yeah, Excellent. Chattahoochee. Excellent. I'm actually typing this as, as, we try, as you're speaking right now. Definitely so. the biggest suggestion is <laughs> yeah. to go to all of these events. <laughs> like, I am here because of Andrew. So. <laughs> uh, and Chattahoochee Tech, um, there was a professor there trying to start a game dev program. So I'm not sure they are. Um, Gwinnett Tech has a good one. 
Uh, Chattahoochee Tech's a good school, so I mean, it's a, it's an excellent tech school. I know the CS program is good. I don't I don't remember how far they got on their own game dev program, but uh, if you're going to Chattahoochee Tech and you're getting your two year, that means uh, KSU is a really good place for you to go for your four year. I actually do transfer. So plan, plan to transfer to KSU. That's, that's oh, excellent game dev program. Here, here's the only question I have: is what part of game dev do you want to get into? Uh, that part I still haven't really gotten into. Well, if you want to be in the back end or world build or general engineering, that's heavier code. Versus if you're getting in the front end of, say, character development, animation and design and that sort of thing, or if you're getting into UX and the actual user experience, or if you're getting into QA and testing and how all that works, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, so as you're starting to study in school, figure out the things that you enjoy, because if you're going to go build a career around it, the th Things that you enjoy are probably not what you want to do for a career. Um, <laughs> because it's a whole lot better than doing the things you hate. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Because it's much better to get paid for the thing. Oh, no, wait. Sorry, that's that's coming out the wrong way. Um, if you're going into the development, understand the way all of it works and find the things that you are passionate about, but are also not so passionate about that this is love and I love to do it that you can get to the point where you hate it and this comes from I've only done 30 something years in tech um, Here you go. any other questions come get this say so go and reach out and, uh, <laughs> good evening Good evening. Good evening. So Good I have a evening. question for, I guess, all of you. Uh, um, so I self-published a kids' book, and uh, it's it it kind of predates SpongeBob, kind of, because the initial, um, I guess, intellectual property that has been filed as a copyright kind of predates SpongeBob. But I kind of, I guess, my question is probably more for UTJ. Is um, uh, they filed first? Yeah. <laughs> well. They uh, have a bigger pocketbook. That's true. That's also true. But can I continue to crush your dream? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> crush away. Crush away. <laughs> no, no. Please ask. It. Um, how would you recommend I go about navigating um, brand growth with that in mind, knowing that it's ha it has the likeliness of SpongeBob, but it's unique enough to where we can probably avoid copyright infringement? You know. Well, if if you're working on your own content that you created before, right. and you continue to create just that content, and you don't incorporate Spongebob content no sure. then there's no there's no there's no it's your work it doesn't matter okay. um, the challenge that that comes from this type of, of scenario when there's just a huge work that dwarfs the original smaller work is that then there's always that sort of perception then that you're the the second guy the copier right, the, right. That you're doing something wrong um, but in terms of actuality you, you have you have every right to do it. Copyright's a tricky thing because I could write a, a, a the children's book sitting right here, and Tiger Lily could write the exact same children's book while we're both sitting right here. And we wouldn't talk to each other. We just wrote a book, and we happened to coincidentally write word for word the same book. That ain't it's, happening. It, it's unlikely, but it's it, if we did that, even though we have both word for word the same book, they're both independent creations, and we both own individual, independent copyrights. So... The fact that your work is like SpongeBob, but predates SpongeBob, means that you can keep using it, but you're always going to have that perception of right. coming after. That's the tricky part. Okay, so I guess it would be better to uh, <laughs> <laughs> it would be, it'd be better to kind of focus on the individuality of it, probably. Yeah, that, well, yeah, yeah. The more you can do yeah. to separate yourself from it, the better off you're going to be for sure. That's good. But and, and you don't have to worry about it till you get sued. There you go. Cool. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, I suggest you come get one of these because we promote books and authors. <coughs> See, you asked. Now they're all coming. God <laughs> bless it. Y'all are cut into my bar time. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, good evening. I have a. Uh, so, I know you guys were kind of joking around about it, but it's like. 
you want to protect your intellectual property, but if you don't have enough money to protect your intellectual property, then you can't protect your intellectual property? Or? Not necessarily true. Um, so big picture kind of true, to be okay. honest. But the, especially if it's your property and someone else is infringing it, the, the nice thing is there are a variety of ways that you can potentially protect that IP without having to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Someone might take your case on contingency if it's a clear enough case, if it's an obvious enough infringement. And if there's a way to get money. A way to get money, <laughs> then, then someone might take your case on contingency. Conversely, there's a bunch of volunteer organizations or artist organizations or, or other groups that will help bring that case for you uh, or, or, or help financially support your way through the case. So it's not absolutely a, 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 no, a no deal. And, and frankly, if your work is protected, sometimes all it takes is a nasty letter from an attorney to mm -hmm. say, hey, look, I know my rights, I know this is here, and I can come after you, and, and, and you're going to lose, and then you'll pay me a bunch of money. So sometimes, you know, even just a couple hundred dollars for a demand letter is all it takes to protect that, that right. And against big or small entities. But, um, you know, a lot of times, yeah, it sucks if you're, you got SpongeBob and you're going up against Nickelodeon. Right. But um, not everybody's going up against Nickelodeon. A lot uh, of the other well, people who are infringing are equally not in a position to pay $200,000 in litigation. So sure. things resolve. Things settle. Things, you know, your demand is sent. Negotiations are done. Things are, are resolved. Right. So you can absolutely protect your IP. Just Does litigation cost a bunch? Yes. But is there ways to do it? Yes. And, and the odds of you going to, going to litigation are low. Slow. Yeah. I mean, right. a few nasty emails back and forth, a couple of letters will resolve the vast majority of instances. Yeah. Um, I have a client we were doing some work with that it was a trademark instance where the client, I'm going to be nice about it, screwed around and did not file the trademark and let somebody undercut them because they just didn't get off to do the paperwork. And I said, well, great, time to go rebrand. And client was like, what do you mean? Well, but mine's older and mine's this and mine's this and mine's this. And I said, they filed first. And I said, let me call my IP attorney. And the first down payment was $50,000 just to start talking. And I'm, she's like, let's rebrand <laughs> um, versus if you're talking about I've written a book and I've got characters and I've got story um, unless you're selling a lot of books it's probably not going to be a problem if you are selling a lot of books and you've got some money to pay attorneys and I can point you to a lot of cases a couple of which I've been involved in again not an attorney I pick on them but they're very valuable um, they're evil but they're a necessary evil and hi tj um <laughs> yeah, here. but he's got nice hair <laughs> <laughs> much better than mine um well. but uh, you know so any other questions you guys i know we're way into overtime might as well okay oh okay uh let's see hmm <laughs> Scott's going, I got a long weekend I put up with you. Come on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's say you're streaming and you want to cosplay as, like, Iron Man or something. Is that, like, not allowed? Cosplay is a really fun topic. We've had several panels of it over the years. And the answer is no, it's not allowed. None of this is allowed. Hmm. None of it is stopping either. You know why? Because, again, no one, the, the question of infringement is, is it causing me some harm? Because I'm going to have to go pay to stop it, even if it's just sending a letter. Right. I'm going to have to take some action. And is it really harming me? And more importantly, if I send a letter to people who are clearly big fans of my product right. and, and tell them, hey, stop being a big fan of my product, is that a good business decision? <laughs> And not a lot of companies think that's their way to go. So right. you know, there, there are certainly things that, that can be problematic. But big picture, yeah, all of those are, are, are copyrighted, trademarked, and sometimes both characters. And, 
Yee, we absolutely have. This is from The Simpsons. We are absolutely ripping it off. We have no grounds to do it. We've had no permission from any Simpsons source. But you know what? We do it, and we've been doing it for 16 years, and we haven't gotten a nasty letter yet. Because we're not we're not replacing anything. Trust me, if you heard our singing, we are not replacing <laughs> right. the Stonecutters episode. But it is it, it's a it's a question of are you doing some damage, and is it infringing? Yes. Is it illegal? Yes. Is it something anybody's ever going to take any action on? No Depends. way. Well, well it, 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 if you start making a ton of money by being Iron Man in public. Mm-hmm. And you know, doing appearances and things, yeah, maybe that's a problem. If you start painting Disney murals, yeah, maybe that's a problem. But it, it's 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 just not something that anyone's going to come after a fan base for being fans. Okay, I'm going to disagree with the attorney because, well, somebody was dumb enough to make me moderator. <laughs> 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 but uh, again, use the term illegal. Nobody's going to throw you in jail, but they just made the sue the shit out of you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's civil. Yes, it's civil. It's about money. But again, I think the money is if your actions are such a way that you're promoting the product, you're promoting the service, you're promoting a fandom, generally most of those, the rat excluded, most of those are going to say, cool, rock on, because they want to see the growth in the fandom and the product because they recognize the marketing now. I think that is very different. You look at the 70s and the 80s because there was a particular brand that has mouse ears (laughs) and a long nose and another one with bunny ears that were extremely litigious even though it might have been to their benefit. But to tie this back around to the promotion side, if you're not being paid to promote Iron Man, don't say that you're promoting Iron Man or pretend you have any tied MCU or Disney or anything like that. I've seen folks do that with games, implying that they were some sort of official spokesperson and the game companies then were sending out letters saying, don't you do this kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, make sure people know in that case that you are not <laughs> officially right. promoting Yeah. And if you're doing affiliate marketing, if you're getting into saying, I'm an affiliate of, or promoting somebody's game, promoting somebody's book, promoting somebody's whatever it is, be very open and disclosing. I am being pay- I am being compensated to promote X, and make sure you're abiding by those agreements. And this is the look says Scott is going to kick us out of the room. <laughs> so thanks, everybody. But before we get out of here, make sure to come get swag and great. This in your Dragon Con app. Rate us in your Dragon Con app if you enjoyed this and if you got anything out of it. And please come get swag.